Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. My name is Tom Skelton. I'm the CEO of Shore Scripts, and we're excited to be back here at Hims. We're excited to be back here with all of you live, and we want to welcome everybody that is watching online as well. So it's terrific to be back here. Uh, this morning, you can see we've assembled a, a panel of experts to discuss what's going on in the world of interoperability amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, there's a, a lot going on, a lot of change, a lot of challenges, and we're very excited about that. Uh, kicking off first, I wanna thank uh, my colleagues on the Healthcare Leadership Council for all their work on this, and Mary for joining us here today so that we can chat about that. And also, we've got um, representation from ONC, which is also very exciting because they've played a key role in helping to build out the interoperability infrastructure. Now. Um, for the last few years, we've been working at the Healthcare Leadership Council on trying to find ways to better represent and measure the progress of interoperability across the country. And we're going to take some time today to chat about that. And we, we also want to share um, in addition to those measures, some of the results of our own national progress report, which helps tell the story of what SureScripts and its alliance partners have achieved in the, fa in the past year. Um, we're at an interesting time, obviously. The needs of patients have changed. The way they consume health care is extremely different than it used to be. And as a result, the demands on the provider and clinician community are substantially different than they used to be. And so the National Progress Report does a good job of representing some of the things that have changed alongside that. Now, um, when we look at this, um, the, the key for us is really how much utilization of the network is there. And this year, we had 1.89 million health care professionals process over 20 billion transactions, which is a lot of information moving, and it shows continued progress year over year. Now, to summarize some of the key areas and to highlight some of the key areas, um, one of our uh, products is uh, in support of value-based care. It's populations, uh, medication history for populations, and we saw an increase in that utilization of over 53%, which reflects continued progress of the market to helping to manage care and manage cohorts of patients. Um, in addition to that, we saw an 81% increase in, our, in the utilization of clinical direct messaging. And this is provider to provider messaging about an individual patient. Almost 18 million of those were electronic case reports on COVID and a further 21 million were vaccine notifications. So this information is flowing consistently, utilizing that tool and we're very excited about that. And finally, our record locator and exchange offering had 200,000 clinicians utilizing it, and that's an increase of over 44% from the year 2020. So um, the, the key question for the panel today is, is this all good news and are we doing really well or is still more work to be done? And to discuss that, I'm gonna kick it over to Colin, who's going to lead the panel in that discussion. Colin, over to you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone bright and early on a, uh, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that's what happens when you're here at Hims, right? You just lose track of the days. I've lost track of the days. Well, thank you. Um, looking forward to this panel. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, my name is Colin Hung. I'm the uh, chief editor uh, at um, Healthcare IT Today. I'm looking forward to this. And here's the ground rules I'm just going to lay out for everyone for today's uh, debate, or sorry, sorry, today's panel. Uh, <laughs> rule, rule number one, uh, keep your answers short. Uh, number two, it's OK if you want to talk over somebody. I'll allow that. Uh, and uh, Mary, just please don't throw furniture. Um, I'll today. try not to. <laughs> furniture. And I will award points, and there will be a winner oh, named at the end. Okay. That's what's going to happen. OK, so I'm going to ask the panel, each of, each of you, to introduce yourself, your organization, and the secret question, who is your favorite Disney character? Oh. Right, so you have to answer that. That's your first question you have to answer. And Mary, we'll start with you. All right, do you want the answer first? Well, no, wait, you know. oh, I'm going, all right, I'll start with the intro. <laughs> uh, Mary Greeley, president of the Healthcare Leadership Council. And we're a health advocacy trade association based in Washington, DC. Rather unique in that our members are CEOs that represent all the different sectors of healthcare. And uh, we have several of them here today. Uh, members like Shore Scripps, Mayo Clinic. Um, we also have Anthem. So you can see we have health systems, payers, uh, health information technology companies, suppliers, distributors, uh, really, again, the whole continuum of healthcare. As Tom mentioned, we focused a lot on interoperability. 
Uh, and this is really a, a fascinating dynamic time where we're really seeing the value of that. Um, so you'll also see a report on the table by the Health Care Leadership Council as well. Your favorite character? Your favorite character. I'm going to say Pinocchio. Pinocchio. I just found that a fascinating movie as a child. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, Matt Swain. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT at HHS. Uh, we're the lead federal agency for health IT coordination. Um, I've been with ONC for 12 years, spent the first five or six years working on interoperability measurements, so this uh, panel is near and dear mm -hmm. to my heart. Thank you for having me. Uh, for a favorite Disney character, so I was 10 when Toy Story came out and loved that movie. Uh, my sister and brother are eight and ten years younger than me, respectively, and they rewatched it, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand times. Um, I now have a four-year-old, and it's his favorite movie, so I've probably seen Gosh. Toy Story um, way too many times. So I would go with Woody as my favorite Woody, Disney nice. character. I like it. Nice. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Ross. I am Chief Information Officer at Mayo Clinic. And my uh, side gig, I'm the chair of the board of HIMSS, and I'm thrilled to see everyone here as wearing my HIMSS hat. Disney characters, I'm old school, and I think my spirit animal and favorite character is Goofy. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, Ashok Chenaru, I, uh, the chief data and analytics officer at Anthem. Um, so we had a large. Uh, health services company payer. We serve over 118 million members, including 45 million as part of health plans. And my role is I lead all the enterprise uh, data management, analytic platforms. You know, interoperability is a core competency. You know, value-based care, you know, all, all the different analytic functions. Um, as far as my car, uh, I was just, uh, you know, thinking hard. My, I have one son, he's, uh, was not much into Disney, you know, and uh, the only thing I could remember is uh, we saw a toy, toy Story, and that's really <laughs> what comes to mind. Uh, my son was not too interested in, you know, in Disney characters, so uh, I had to think really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm Tom Skelton, I'm the CEO of Sure Scripts. Um, delighted to be here, and I, I would say. Um, it doesn't matter really who my favorite Disney character is. I'm the grandfather of four grandsons, and the Mandalorian is what it's all about. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I've got costumes hanging in my office for Halloween already that my wife has purchased for them to wear for trick-or-treating. So it's got to be the Mandalorian. Wow. wow. Okay, Tom, you get 10 points for picking a Star Wars character, so you, you win that. <laughs> Matt, Matt, unfortunately, you get minus two points for um, reminding everyone how old we really are. Yeah. <laughs> I say you were 10 years old when uh, Toy Story came out. Yeah. So. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so let's get started with a question. As you heard Tom mention off the top, um, there's been some pockets of interoperability success, right? He talked a lot about the metrics from the report around how many, uh, uh, how many uh, uh, calls have been made through the API for population uh, re data retrieval. Where are other uh, successes? Where are some other successes um, in, in interoperability? Where have they happened? Can you give us some examples? And let's, let's start with you, Mary, and then we'll go yeah, to- Yeah, well, I'll go to a, a personal experience. Um, I'm delighted to live in an area, Annapolis, Maryland, uh, where the health system there has a fully integrated electronic health record. Uh, my husband, four years ago, had a very unusual stroke. And it is one that just affected his optic nerve. Mm. And he lost the vision in kind of the one half of each eye. It's very unusual. But anyway, um, he needed to have several tests done to really figure out what had happened. So we went to the emergency room. He's admitted overnight. The next day, we go to an ophthalmologist, a neurologist, a cardiologist, and then eventually back to his primary care physician. When we're with the cardiologist, the cardiologist said, this is going to sound strange um, because you have very low cholesterol levels, um, but the latest data shows that a statin would be good for you. I'm gonna recommend it, but talk to your primary care physician. We go back to the primary care physician the next day. He looks at it, goes, I, I don't think so. But the cardiologist had included the latest clinical research. And once he looked at it, he said, you know, I think she's right. 
And to me, that was a power because we had all of that information in one place and that primary care physician could make a decision right away. Um, so I think we've seen some really exciting things happening um, in patients using the record, but also the clinicians. I love that personal example. Matt, what about you? Where, where are you seeing some pockets of success for interoperability? So I think for a while we looked at interoperability as you know, the glass being half empty. But I think there's a lot to be excited about right now. Um, you could look at the national exchange networks like eHealth Exchange, Commonwealth, um, and they're conducting millions of transactions each day. Um, some of the state and local networks are also facilitating tons of transactions. And then this is an exciting year. It's 2022. Um, you know, back in 2014, I think we worked on the information blocking report. And it's been a long journey to get those regulations in place. Uh, um, go into effect this year, but this is the year that information blocking is in effect. This is the year that uh, the APIs will be required, and we've already seen tremendous uptick in fire, and that's before it's been required. And we have the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement that just went alive. And for those that aren't familiar, um, that's kind of the governance approach to connect um, health information networks, so to have a, um, a low floor and then to build on that and to start tackling different use cases, starting with um, care, but also then focusing on individual access and public health and other um, use cases. And then patient access, I think, is a huge success. We all can access our information now via a portal, which um, wasn't the case uh, a few short years ago. Excellent. Chris, what are your thoughts? So I guess I would push back a little bit respectfully on the premise. I don't think it's pockets of success. I think it's deep veins of success, to be perfectly honest. To add to Colin's numbers, I think ONC, I heard Mickey Tripathi say 86% of providers were attached to one of the two exchange networks. Maybe that number is higher. Uh, and you heard the numbers from Tom about billions of uh, exchanges happening. You know, if, if, if interoperability was analogous to, say, aerospace, I think we've achieved orbital flight. Um, and there's more to go from there. And I have to tell you, I was one of those guys building rockets uh, to get up to suborbital flight in 2005 and 2006, and it was brutal. It just isn't. Personal example, um, I had some health issues associated with treatment of cancer, and I had a neurologist visit next day, visit with a physical therapist in a different health system. I meet my PT, she said, I'm reading your really interesting neurolog neurologist's report. Um, so the method to notify her that there was a report, that she went to go read it, blah, blah, blah. So are our doctors happy with interoperability? No, they're not. Orbital flight is not adequate. So uh, talk more about you know, what's next. Yeah. I would start by saying uh, treating interoperability as a, as a core competency is uh, really the foundation rather than looking at it as uh, we have a mandate, and we need to meet that. Number two is uh, interoperability is not just a payer provider. You know, I look at the whole person, so it has to. The focus has to be on, you know, community organizations, you know, like home health, you know, social drivers. You know, so we have to factor in all the different uh, aspects of interoperability because connectivity. You know, it's not just. You know, a member going to the health system and coming back home, so the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. As far as where we've had success, I would say um, uh, very uh, you know, focused on all the, uh, the mandated requirements because we didn't treat it as a core competency like patient access API, the provider, you know, the payer to payer data exchange, the formulary API, you know, and the provider directory data API, you know, like uh, we delivered it for all our three lines of business, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial, but also set, up, uh, uh, set it up as a core competency so we offered the services for you know, outside our core health plan membership too. So working with employers because you know, they don't really care about the payer aspect of it, they care about the whole person, mm -hmm. like all employers. Mm -hmm. right? In fact, we even have a, a, a booth here focused on, okay, what have we done, what worked, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do think, like I mentioned, getting the community health organization, home health, skilled nursing facilities, mm -hmm. you know, all these you know, smaller systems who can't afford to meet this interoperability requirements, you know, like health-related social needs organizations, even a lot of the data we captured from a health risk assessments, 
that connectivity, I feel, is where we are uh, like uh, not as much focused, you know, because they don't have the infrastructure or they don't really have the, the visibility. So I see a lot more opportunities there. And, and from a like a value back, you know, it's, it always goes back to what is in it for the consumer or how do we simplify the admin burden, you know, and I think during you know, COVID, one of the great examples on the power of interoperability is, you know, health systems were burdened. You know, we had a lot of folks that got admitted where the primary care physician didn't know whether they have been admitted or discharged. You know, again, ADT data is a great example there. So we enabled that across the country, you know, like, um, and uh, when one of the members get admitted, you know, you notify the primary care physician. You know, and they get discharged, you get the discharge instructions and then send it to our care management or to the primary care because we were seeing in some pockets, you know, within the first five days, the readmission was at 45%. So real, uh, when you come up with real actionable examples in terms of what it means, then you get broader adoption. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I know, like Tom, you mentioned about, you know, the opportunity to integrate back into the provider workflow. You know, you know, we partner with you. Huge opportunity on medication adherence, you know, like, and, and, you know, gaps in care, you know, because when we have the longitudinal view, the opportunity is how do you make sure that information gets integrated back into the provider workflow? Yep. Tom? Yeah, I, I would say, actually, one of the biggest things that we have to remember here is that <clears throat> we, we've been on this journey for a while, to Chris's point. Um, in fact, I can tell you, my first experience with interoperability was living in Roanoke, Virginia. I was based in Pittsburgh. But I moved to Roanoke, Virginia for 12 weeks to try and submit claims electronically mm. um, to a mainframe. It was not a fun experience mm. in my career. It's what moved me into the management ranks, out of the tech ranks. <laughs> um, but I, I would tell you the biggest thing I think we've managed to achieve is trust. Um, the, the providers, the clinicians, they are not happy with the level of interoperability but the information that is moving is trusted. Mm -hmm. And that is an important element of all this. That is a foundational element of all of this. And it's what gives us permission to go on and do more. So that journey that Chris talked about that he was part of, that those were important steps. And everywhere along the way, we have continued to build trust, mm -hmm. both as a, in private industry as well as in the public mindset. Well, I think on that point, we've seen, I think, a significant shift <laughs> Uh, on the issue of privacy. Um, at the Healthcare Leadership Council, we've been working on that issue since HIPAA uh, was first passed and trying to convince people uh, the importance of healthcare providers having their information to improve their healthcare. And I think one thing that has come out of this pandemic is people are well aware of how important it is to have that information. Um, and for us to have real world examples that we can take to legislators um, to convince them that we need to have the, what I call the necessary flow of information, and then of, of course assuring that we're protecting that information. I would say that, and the, the big shift I've also seen is that I always said when working this issue, we really need to create consumer demand for this information, to be able to access their information and to act on that information. And I think people are now coming to expect to have it. I like that, Mary. You get 10 points for that. Um, <laughs> no, but, it, but it, you, you're absolutely right. It, it, before, um, patients couldn't actually do much with that data other than to keep it, maybe bring it to the next doctor that they were seeing. So they were the interoperability conduit. But now there's a lot of applications and things that they can, they can use it for. So you're right, the demand is now to, there, and I think that will help grease the wheels of, of interoperability. So, and, and along, so along this note, you know, it's, t it's 2022. Um, I think for the last 10 years, we've been talking about interoperability here at HIMSS. Uh, and, and Matt, to your point, I think in the past, it has been glass half empty kind of approach. So to turn it around, now that it is 2022, where have we gotten it right? And what work still remains to be done? We'll start with you, Matt, like, <laughs> since you brought that up in terms of the positivity around uh, interoperability. Great, yeah, so first I'll start with our patient access because we've uh, just discussed that. Um, 2012, we started tracking um, how many hospitals offer their patients access to their medical records. And back in 2012, it was one quarter of hospitals, just 25%. 
2014, Meaningful Use Stage 2 goes into effect where CMS and ONC require uh, view, download, and transmit of that information. And we saw that number in just two years jump to 90%. Um, which is um, incredible um, you know, for that time period. But that's just, as you said, viewing that information. Um, you know, we've been working um, for 10, 12 years now on creating the infrastructure for a platform-based exchange, starting with a $15 million grant to Boston Children's back in 2010 that led to the smart framework. Um, we've invest invested a lot of money in fire, fire, so hopefully folks can do more with that information soon. But what does that actually mean when patients have access to their information? What outcomes can they achieve? Um, and that's where I think HLC can you know, help with um, understanding that. Um, I saw a study recently by Epic, and they found that um, patients that view were active portal users um, were significantly likely to have shorter lengths of stay than patients that weren't. And that's just portal access. And you know, we've been also tracking the demand on the consumer side with annual surveys and more and more patients each year are accessing the portal. You know, not all patients need um, portal access, um, but when they do, it's there. Um, but I think when you look at what work remains, um, the incentive payments really motivated hospital and providers to um, digitize their health records. Um, but there were providers that were left out, behavioral health, long-term, post-acute care. Um, we incentivize providers to send information to public health, but not the um, you know, reverse of them sending back data to physicians. Um, so there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done um, with interoperability to um, help with uh, those providers that um, are not as far along and to also look at some of the expanded use cases as we start to integrate social determinants of health and bring in social services and other players into the mix. Excellent. Chris? So uh, I'm going to be the annoying geek for a minute. Um, we got something really wrong in 2009 with first meaningful use where we should have implemented exchange in the form of, here we go, geek language, you know, restful APIs that helped us exchange data in a certain way. Restful APIs are the way that the internet works. Um, for every exchange on a website, that's what you're using. And we didn't do that. Um, and it was because um, of a bunch of really bad reasons, to be perfectly honest. And so we bumbled along for a couple of years using other kinds of methods for moving documents around, and we didn't get the payload right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, fast forward a number of years, the, the, um, the future is going to be defined by what we do with the FHIR standard and the way the data is exchanged, because FHIR is not just um, provider to consumer or provider to payer or payer to consumer. It's embedded in every new product that you're going to go find on the show floor at HIMSS. Every innovator is building all their stuff on FHIR because it's a rich set of ways to access data and to say, what do I want? Because one of the problems that we have, and it relates to the privacy issues Mary's handing uh, mentioned, is that uh, we have these big, fat payloads of data today that we're moving around. And it causes some privacy questions. So I gave the example of my neurologist and my physical therapist. You know, there's a bunch of data that came along with my neurologist report my physical therapist didn't need to see. Did I care? Nah, not really. Um, but under certain conditions, I really would. So by getting to a fire standard, we'll be able to get to just the stuff that we want. Um, and that, that process is moving along um, pretty, pr uh, pretty well, I think. I want to make one comment about consumerism. Um, we have really good adoption of our portal and our app. Something like 75% of patients use the app within two weeks before a visit or after a visit. But here's the thing, it's episodic. Outside that period of time, people don't care about looking at their data. Like, I got it. I had this bad health incident. I, I managed it well. I'm good. I'm not going to be checking my numbers every day. Maybe I'm looking at my step counter on my phone. But other than that, I don't care. So I think we've got to figure out how to deal with this kind of episodic model around consumerism. Because I just don't think there's latent demand amongst all of us to every day download all of our health data and take a look. I, I just don't, I don't see people wanting uh, that. But I could be wrong. Interesting question. Ashok. Yeah. Um, so on, um, I think what we got right is you know, meeting the mandated requirements like the patient access API, you know, the formulary API, the payer-to-payer -payer, you know, data exchange. You know, the key would be, you know, how do we, in terms of where the 
you know, the progress. One is, you know, I know security, auditability is being mentioned as a, a key issue with huge payloads, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say blockchain is a, a concept we started, you know, along with, you know, uh, we partnered with company called Avenir. You know, there are a lot of other, you know, industry uh, like Cleveland Clinic, you know, like uh, Aetna, IBM, et cetera, PNC. So, um, and that, you know, obviously, it's still in, you know, like early, you know, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity there where the payloads are not moving and uh, you are leveraging, you know, the power of blockchain from a, auditability, security, visibility, et cetera, right? So different innovative ways is where we need to look at, you know, because moving payloads, yeah, I think fire can definitely help, but we should, uh, big opportunity with, uh, with blockchain. Number two is on the consumer access, you know, we have um, our uh, consumer facing portal app uh, that has 20 million registered users. Um, uh, huge progress when it comes to you know signing them up, uh, and uh, and and where we have seen opportunities or we have seen good usage of it on a continuous basis. When I say continuous, at least logging in once a month is when we have a comprehensive view of their claims, clinical and every data labs, uh, etc. So we have data for you know uh, uh, fairly rich medical records for over 15 million lives and almost 22 million lives where we have lab data. Um, and, and then our partnership with Epic, both in terms of getting co complete medical records and pushing gaps in care into the provider workflow. So we have seen good usage between my chart and our portal. So, so uh, the point I'm making is uh, where we have complete data, you see huge adoption. When we don't, then you see pockets of engagement. Tom, bring it home. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think, first of all, I think we built a, a fabulous foundation and we're in a, a good position to move forward from here. Um, we've all kind of grown up in the industry looking at use cases to justify allocation of resources. And I think what we're starting to see is an innovation ecosystem building that is outside some of the core use cases that we all contemplated up front. Mm -hmm. And this is really where the consumer, the patient is going to get the greatest benefit. This is where we can move from retrospectively or viewing data retrospectively and starting to think about things prospectively and really truly managing the health of Americans, particularly um, some Americans that need you know, more than, than the average, right? We, we've got a lot of folks on specialty medications, et cetera, where the ecosystem around that is still laden with a tremendous amount of friction. And we have an opportunity here to use this information to reduce that friction, reduce time to fill substantially. We're, we're seeing a reduction with some of our new tools where instead of it taking you know, 10 days to two weeks, you know, we're down to a couple of days now. Mm -hmm. That can make a massive difference in the life of somebody that needs that specialty medication. And that's just one example. I think they're all around the industry. And that's, that'll get uh, us to the point where we can unleash some of the machine learning and analytics, et cetera, that we've all been leaning into for years but didn't have the full data set. Mm -hmm. But I also think we're, we're changing the incentives. Um, Shook mentioned value-based care, and our members are fully committed to value-based care. Um, that really means that you need the, the patient and consumer as a partner in managing their health care if you're going to, as a provider, get the outcomes that you're looking for. Um, you well described the, what I call the bird's eye view that the plans have and all that information. Um, so the incentive now for providers is we're all going to be in this together. We're going to manage the care of that patient across a whole continuum, including their, their medications. Um, so we need to work together. But I think what had been missing for a long time in this area were the appropriate financial incentives. I mean, we all want to do good, but at the end of the day, those financial incentives make a difference. And so as we see that drive towards value-based care, we're going to need immediate access to that information. We're going to need for patients and consumers to access that information and use it um, to be that true partner in getting those better outcomes at a lower cost. Yeah. And, and just tagging on to that, uh, when it comes to incentivizing the providers and pushing them to value-based care, one of the foundational aspect of interoperability where it would help is using the burden, administrative burden, which is like prior auth automation. So that's one of the consistent feedback we hear from the providers that, 
you know, uh, that, like you know, simplify prior auth, automate, and data interoperability is the foundation for that. Because if you can automate prior auth, if we can streamline the whole payment aspect, providers are ready to engage and even sign up for downside risk arrangements versus just you know, like shared savings where there's only upside but no downside. So that's the power of uh, interoperability. Yeah, I, I also have to say legislatively, because I spend a lot of time working with Congress, if you could automate prior auth, you've taken a big issue off the <laughs> legislative agenda. Yeah. That'd be great. I like it. Uh, Chris, you win that round, 10 points for bringing up consumerism. <laughs> All right. I think it was really good. Uh, asking a very key question about what's going to be the incentives for people to really want their data. I think, Mary, you brought up a good point about value-based care. I think is one of the, maybe the big drivers for patients wanting this data. So can I get five points for that? Yeah, five points for that. <laughs> uh, sure. I have to give you 10 points for, for being We're courage, asking for, for the being, five? Well, no, for being courageous <laughs> and bringing up prior auth in a conversation right. <laughs> around interoperability. So congratulations like to this you. Is, like whose line is it anyways? Yes, exactly. That's what it is. <laughs> Um, Who's keeping score? Yeah. <laughs> I got it all up here. All right, yeah. that's good. Uh, so let's talk about uh, uh, this measurement framework that is on the table there. It's excellent. Lots of really good measures in there that you come up with. Um, two questions, two-part question. Number one, why is it important to know for people to use that measurement framework to actually understand where they are in terms of interoperability? And then the second part of that question is, when they do measure themselves, <laughs> Are we going to find that we're better than we are, think we are, or that we are worse than we think we are in terms of interoperability? Meaning, do we have a lens of, like, we believe we're really good, and actually we're really not? Chris, we'll start with you on this question. Well, I think part of it is, um, you know, you can look at the scale and say, or, or you can measure yourself or whatever and say, hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm an eight or maybe even a nine, but the problem is the scale goes to 100. <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't have a measuring stick, you, you, you don't know. And um, I, I think, you know, I've been kind of the op at one of the optimists up here about how well we've done and so on. I think it's been pretty remarkable. But th th sort of that's not the point. The point now is our healthcare system is pretty badly broken. Um, we don't really have a handle on how we're going to deal with cost reduction and health improvement. All those use cases, frankly, I don't know if I can enumerate them, are just sitting there. Um, and interoperability isn't the only tool that's going to fix that problem, but it's a really important tool in the toolbox. So that's why I would say it's, it's important to, to have a sense of where do you stand and then a sense about what, you know, what's achievable. And do, you, and do you think when people do you measure themselves that they'll be better than they thought they were, or do you think we've got rose-colored glasses on? That is a great question. Uh, mm, uh, you know, I don't know uh, comprehensively how all, I'll just speak for provider groups. I don't know comprehensively how all of them think about it. I think for a lot of CIOs, this was a problem that was just this awful, bleeding, festering problem for a long time. And now they may feel like, whew, got it, check, done. I've implemented my 21st century cures requirements. I'm good to go. Um, but that's not enough. Yeah. All right. Ashok. Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, measurement at least will raise the awareness, and I think uh, that's a good thing. But I would say, you know, the key question of the so what, you know, as a result of, you know, meeting all these mandates, it, all, it has to align with, you know, are we getting the right insights and integrating into the provider workflow? like uh, where we can see actionable results, or are we sending this information through the consumer engagement channels or within the payer to our care management team? And as a result of this data being shared through this interoperability frameworks, what results are we truly seeing? Mm -hmm. you know, unless we measure based on results and outcomes, it doesn't matter. You know, we can talk about great metrics. See, that's how we are pivoting to, we can talk about like, um, now, before the conversation, at least I used to have is, oh, we have data for over, you know, 200 million lives, you know, and we have 15 million medical records, you know, 22 million lab records, et cetera. And then uh, the key question comes up, okay, so what? Right. Right? And, and the so what is, you know, like, um, how have we helped, you know, like uh, the providers, because providers are already overburdened with a lot of, you know, like, um, 
uh, administrative work or you know the medical record. So if you try to push gaps in care, medication adherence, and other things, are they taking action? Is it integrated into the workflow, or, or do they have to log into a payer-specific portal? And and even for the consumers, are we sending the information in a manner that they would log in and use it at the right time so they can take some action? So I would say the uh, the framework should pivot to more on the outcomes, so that way we get the reality check. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, I think um, it's important to, to step back and look at what we were trying to do when we put together some of the measurements there. The, the idea wasn't to try and prove that we were done or that we were in the home stretch. The idea here is that fundamentally, healthcare is personal, emotional, and it's filled with anecdote. And that's one of the challenges that interoperability has faced. It's, it's anecdote for anecdote. And, and then the data became volume-based data, which frankly doesn't tell the whole story either. And so we tried to step back from that, move beyond the anecdote and say, so we're, really, we're the milestones here so that we can measure progress. It wasn't about proving that we're close to an end. It was proving that we're constantly better than the day before and that every day there is progress being made somewhere. And while the, the list may not be a complete and comprehensive um, a set of uh, a cohort of, of all the things that can be done with interoperability, it's a really good and strong framework across a cross section of industry about what's going on there that people can look to and say, you know what, yes, there, there is progress being made here. So now the question becomes, is it fast enough and is it progress in the right areas? And maybe we need to spend more time in areas that are underserved right Right now, you know, social determinants being a great example of that. I, I think that's what we were trying to do, and I, I think it will start to serve as a north star. Mm -hmm. and, and I think another important point is how can it inform our work with ONC? How can we have that true private public sector collaborative in developing these measures? And I think we felt um, really giving a window into what is the private sector doing, as you mentioned, Tom not just gathering the information, but how do you make it actionable? Um, and you know, I just think it's so important that we partner with ONC as we're developing these measures, um, show what the private sector is doing. I think we have a real responsibility to take a leadership role in this, um, but working with ONC is just, it's just such a dynamic uh, entity. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we look forward to how can we integrate this work. Yeah, I view uh, interoperability and interoperability measurement as sort of like the high jump. Um, you set the bar, you run, you, do, you clear the bar, and you're not done. Your event's still going on, they just raise the bar, and um, you know, we need to continuously look for new areas to, to measure progress. So ONC, we have three national um, surveys. Um, we survey hospitals, ambulatory care providers, and patients. Um, then we also have other measurement efforts. And these surveys are self-reported, so they're limited but they do provide a nice national snapshot. And I think that's um, one of the toughest issues when it comes to interoperability measurement is to get that national, national sampling frame, to get the right person answering the survey is incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, so going back to build on the outcomes, like I love to see the report that you all just published that shows outcomes, because that's what we're truly interested in. And um, I think um, in 2012, I went on a site visit to a large integrated delivery network, and they were doing incredible work for quality improvement, partnering nurses and physicians with engineers to take advantage of their interoperable data. Um, and they solved problems and then they just moved on where um, at ONC we love to see that work, but we also love to see that it gets published so we can learn from it. We're a very data-driven um, organization and I think it would benefit um, you know, there others in the healthcare system to learn from those lessons too. Um, but it's, it's just very challenging. Um, one other example, so we conducted a laboratory survey in 2012 and this is incredibly difficult to, um, there's 10,000 independent and clinical labs to get them to know, you know are you using HL7 V2 or LOINC? Like, they have no idea. Um, so when we look at HLC, you know, there's members that um, could you know, provide a lot of insight and that's part of the mosaic, that's part of the story and that's what we you know, really need to understand um, you know, what the big players like LabCorp and Quest can do and how they can prove outcomes and efficiencies, but um, you know, that doesn't tell the entire story since there's tons of um, other clinical laboratories out there. Um, so it's just that balance of um, telling you know, the impact that some of the larger players are having, but also looking to find ways to measure progress um, to address some of those gaps. Nice. 
Ashok, you, go, you win this round. 10 points for you for bringing out <laughs> outcomes. I think that's really good. We, we definitely have to focus on the outcomes. Uh, five bonus points for, for you, Matt, for using Loink in a sentence. <laughs> but that was that's pretty impressive. It's impressive for me. I'm not the standards person. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard word to, to get around. Um, <laughs> now, we will have time for at the end for questions. So if you do have a question for the, for the panel, now is the time to start thinking about that. Right? And uh, we, I was told that they really like hard questions. Yeah. So, so please. <laughs> Bring it on. Uh, please feel free to ask them. So uh, let me go to this one, though. Um, for those that are, that are watching online, for those in the audience, you know, now we have a framework, a beginning, as you said, Tom, a foundation to build from to understand where we are on interoperability. What would one piece of practical advice that you would give to somebody who's maybe starting to look at this measurement framework and using it, but maybe also just now making a serious push in terms of interoperability? Right? Hearing all the good things that are now possible, hearing um, going beyond the compliance aspect of it. So what would one piece of practical advice be for, for someone who's in that situation? And Ashok, I'm going to put you on the, uh, yep. on the hot seat. Yeah, I, I would say start with getting stakeholder uh, alignment across the uh, enterprise, you know, depending on the size of the organization. It has to, like you said, it has to go beyond a mandate. It has to impact as a competitive differentiator or consumer experience or provider collaboration on value-based care. So, and the other aspect too is, it's about the whole person health and, and how interoperability, you know, because in the last couple of years, huge investments on social equity, digital health equity. So how does this help beyond just the clinical, the payer provider? It goes to, you know, getting pharma to collaborate all the you know the like the health equity aspects because you can build great tools but if you don't get the engagement from all these you know segments of uh, consumers then you are not creating the biggest impact so uh, like I, and i think you have to focus on telling the story on how it helps their uh, business on the power of the connectivity and collaboration and interoperability that's where you get the alignment rather than making it one size uh, fits all the other aspect of this uh, from a, a data connectivity you know, related to health equity is the race, ethnicity, and language data. You know, I know there's a lot of collaboration happening around that, but how do we really put more emphasis on that? You know, because time and again, we have seen you know, uh, like um, you know, uh, readmissions or you know, engagement or you know, like uh, give an example in um, in Buckhead, you know, which is a, a fairly well-to-do neighborhood in Atlanta, um, in suburbs of Atlanta, average life expectancy is 86 years old. Three miles from the center of Buckhead, it goes down to 64. And an average cost to treat a diabetic there, you know, is 30 percent higher for the same age between Buckhead and three miles from the center of Buckhead. So, how do we really? tell the story and engage them is through interoperability and getting all the data from a whole person health rather than just looking at the clinical aspects. Mm -hmm. Love it. Tom. You know, if you're, if you're starting um, this journey, the, the biggest thing you're embarking on is an exercise in change management, right? You, you've got to find a, a champion and now you've got to start to build out your case for change and you've got to be able to reinforce that you're making progress against that. And so I would say the biggest advice that I would give is make sure that you know where your bullseye is step by step so that you're in a position where you can claim progress because you're not going to be able to claim success with this one. You can only claim progress towards the ultimate end game. Mary, what about you? Well, listening to some of the comments here, I, I would beg and plead that we have standardization as we're gathering all of this critical data, especially on social determinants of health. Um, because I fear it'll be just gather all this information and then there's no uniformity to it. Um, also a big believer in the carrot rather than the stick. And I think we talked a lot about how do we align everyone's interest, um, focus on the patient consumer. And I think we are headed in that direction and seeing good progress in that. Um, and I've really been struck during this pandemic at the ability of many of our members to get more of that micro view um, that Ashok just mentioned, rather than just the big picture or maybe even a certain geographical area, but really being able to target um, individuals that are in need 
Uh, it's been absolutely critical during this pandemic, um, not just to trace the spread, but also what are the vaccination rates, all that useful information. Mm -hmm. Matt? When it comes to interoperability measurement, my advice would be to make it simple for um, the person that is either answering a survey or doing the data analysis of you know, the transaction data. Um, one question that we worked on um, way back when for our, both our hospital survey and our clinician survey is do you have the um, right information when treating a patient from an, um, from an outside source? And um, it's been a very illuminating measure, and it's been a measure that we've been able to pair with other data to help show progress or the benefits. Um, it's unfortunately pretty low right now in the ambulatory care space, where I think only like th one third of providers say they have the information that they need when treating a new patient. But the measures that we use to, um, for interoperability, which is to send, find, receive, and integrate, the providers that can do all four of them, which isn't a huge percentage, but the providers that can do all four, 90% of them have the information that they need when treating a new patient. Mm -hmm. So finding those understandable questions or um, the data requests that are um, easy to understand in this very technical space, and then pairing that with other data or emerging data sources can be um, very illustrative. Mm -hmm. Chris, what advice do you have? Well, so I, I, I really liked uh, Matt's answer, uh, and it was part of what I was uh, going to say, which is I think we've proven we can do interoperability for some. I think the issue is now how do we do it for all is probably a, a big issue. So, you know, I think we can categorize where the boundaries are of the use cases that will be important, and one really important one will be did the patient and their care provider have the right information to make the right decision at this point to get the right diagnosis and the right level of care. And we're not there yet, um, to Matt's example. Another sort of hemisphere that uh, we need to, to worry about is where are there people in trouble who need help who are not being helped? And we're not very good at that. We can see some of them, but we can't see all of them. And uh, we need to do a whole lot better at that. There's maybe another big circle of can we do all this work more efficiently and take cost and time out of the system? So, you know, I think we're going to be filling in a whole set of use cases in those areas. Um, I really like the accelerator groups around uh, the FIRE standard that are trying to focus in on specific uh, problems. You've got Argonaut that's, you know, kind of provider-oriented but looks at other stuff. You've got DaVinci that's mostly payer-oriented but it's looking at other stuff, et cetera. So to me, I think it is around filling out you know, completeness. We, you know, we can put a rocket up into space, and we can zoom some people around for a couple orbits, and we can land them. We're kind of Gemini era. But you know, what we're really thinking about next is space stations and exploration to the moon and those kinds of things. Um, and those are big, grand challenges. We've got tons of opportunity. <laughs> I think yeah. one component we haven't really touched on, and that is the public health infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, such a critical component, we're well aware of it. I'm not sure um, any of us really understood how dire the need is um, to improve their interoperability, use of electronic health information. Um, and the good news is that there is funding coming their way. Um, we're just gonna have to make sure that it's targeted in the right way okay. and used efficiently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think COVID also showed how quickly we can all pivot when mm -hmm. we need to, mm -hmm. right? It, it showed our ability to be much more nimble um, in our thinking, in our responsiveness to a big need like that than, than maybe we would have recognized up front. There were a lot of plans that got set aside in order to focus on that. And, you know, just the, the way that we were all transferring information about vaccine statuses and, you know, taking a look at how do we get all these forms into the government so that they understand what the status is uh, of the populist. I, I think that was an important pivot. Mm -hmm. And it showed the power of the tools and the power of the innovation that can follow that may not be on anybody's use case map, but all of a sudden is front and center and needs mm -hmm. to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. yeah, to build on that point very quickly to look at progress, um, though public health is not nearly where we want it to be, um, when you just mentioned uh, you know, vaccination status. So and see, I mentioned we funded uh, $15 million to Boston Children's in 2010 to create the SMART framework. Um, during the pandemic, the private sector ran with that and they used the SMART framework for vaccination status. And I think I read somewhere 80% like of Americans can access their vac uh, vaccination credentials using that SMART framework, which is um, incredible to, um, that we have that in place now. There's still a ton of work to do, but um, mm -hmm. you know, there are some bright spots. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think access versus you know the outcomes is really where the question is. You know, access only solves. It's a it's a good start, but you know how many people are using it and how actionable that information is. You know, to look at the whole person, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, I really like your example. I mean, I think COVID really did show us that on a micro level, we can move very quickly and adopt new technology. All of a sudden, the barriers that were there are suddenly melted away. Uh, I also think at a macro level, just, you know, again, with the panelists up here, government, uh, you know, uh, payers, providers, uh, vendors, all got together and were able to collaborate very quickly and make things happen that would have taken years <laughs> otherwise. Mm -hmm. So we proved to ourselves that we can work together as well. So, you know, the a silver lining out of the out of the pandemic, I think, was that. And and hopefully we can carry that forward in the next couple of years. So now we've got some time for for questions. Oh, I gotta name a winner for that round. Matt, you, you won that round. <laughs> uh, plus ten points. I think sure, you're moving up. Some there. really good examples. Yeah, yeah you, you got yourself out of the negative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah in a bit of a hole. So we have some time for, yeah, so put up your hand. I don't know if we have a microphone or anything, but I, otherwise just yell it out and I'll repeat the question. Go ahead, Fred, we'll start with you and then we'll go to you. When you brought up the issue of vaccine data, and, and I held a work group with eight health plans for two big vax manufacturers about what was going on, and their biggest issue was they actually didn't have the vaccine. Yeah. That they couldn't access, so they didn't know who in their plans was vaccinated or not. And what we've really seen with COVID was the politicization of data. Probably no more than maybe back in the day when we were doing HIV work and stuff like that. Was the data so political? What role do each of you play in trying to overcome that so that keeps the data from flowing? I can't get my vaccine records that Mayo has it somehow, but I couldn't get it through my state. Hmm. Interesting question. Fred, thanks for, for, thanks for asking a very tough one. Who wants to take a shot at that, at that one? Lots I can, I can take ahead, a bit of a, a shot in terms of the, the payer aspect of that. Um, a, a lot of the discussions that have been held around interoperability in its earliest phases have been provider to provider connectivity mm -hmm. and getting information to the clinicians, et cetera. I, I would say that the role of the health plan has changed and evolved and lines are getting blurred and, and their ability and desire to take care of us as a whole patient is, is also evolving. And as it does, their interest in this information is growing. We were chatting right before the, right before the session about how we might work together, do a whiteboarding session to make available some of the information that flows through the SureScripts network um, to the folks at Anthem. They're already doing a lot of great work with us, but there, there's more to be done there. So this is all part and parcel of that journey that I talked about earlier, and we, we have to we have to be balanced in our assessment of it. I think we have to respect the progress that we've made on the provider to provider side, while at the same time saying we're not satisfied and we're going to do this whiteboard session. And now what we're going to do is start to get Anthem access to the information it needs so that you get the care that you need. Yeah, so from a, um, the progress to answer your question specifically, um, you know, yeah, we were struggling to begin with to get access, you know, but the easier one was if there is a claim associated you know, we know it, but then again, that could be up to four or five weeks old, right? So we started working with all the potential, you know, CVS, you know, like uh, the pharmacies, you know, we started getting, you know, you know like uh, uh, federal health state registries. Uh, and, and we had to make a very, um, you know, focused effort and prioritization because we knew the value of the vaccination status, you know, like for different aspects, you know, care delivery, engaging, letting the primary care providers know. So uh, right now I would say we are in the 70% range in terms of getting that information. Uh, like, but uh, the key is the amount of effort and lack of, um, you know, like uh, Tom was saying that everybody should have access to the data in order for it to be truly impactful. I think the root of the case that you gave is the chronic underfunding of public health infrastructure. It's just terrible. And it's been that way for a really long time. Um, it's state administered. In some states, it's county administered. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they operate on a pittance. And I think we really saw that during the pandemic. I think there was a lot of private effort to try and prop up public health infrastructure. But that those resources are going to drift back away again. So I'm optimistic when Mary says we're going to get more funding for public health because it's... it's uh, <laughs> It's, it's, really, it's really a bad situation how badly we underfund public health infrastructure. 
No, I, I think people were shocked to find out that a lot of information is just being faxed, that it couldn't be electronically transmitted. Um, and on the political question, I assume you're talking about the vaccine passport. And sometimes what just seems common sense to all of you that are in the industry, you kind of forget the, the politician's um, view of the world. And you know it was just the wrong word to use, even though it made a whole lot of sense to do it. So instead, we do this big workaround. Um, but it's um, what I do for a living is to try and educate <laughs> politicians. And sometimes you just can't get past. You know, the, they're like this. <laughs> the winds were blowing in the wrong direction. Awesome. Uh, I think we had a question. Oh, yeah. Hi, Kate Corbett, Fusion Health. Um, when I hear about bright spots or accelerators, what I hear are constituencies that are already very large and well-resourced continuing to make progress, which is great. But what does that mean for all of the rest of the healthcare ecosystem that gets largely ignored? Long-term care, skilled nursing facilities, correctional institutions, university health clinics, mm -hmm. school health, mobile dental units. Like we forget that millions upon millions of people get their care in these ways mm -hmm. and not from these large, well-resourced constituencies. Mm -hmm. So how can we take the progress and the bright spots and make them meaningful to those mm -hmm. millions and millions of people who don't have you all as advocates on a day-to-day -day basis? Wow, excellent question. Yeah. Excellent question. Two, 10 points for you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Audience winner. <laughs> Matt, 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 you want to take a shot at that one? Sure. Um, so at ONC, we definitely look across the care continuum, and we want to help all, all providers. Um, my colleague is in the back, and he runs our interoperability policy team. And um, we do have a lot of work um, with, for long-term care and behavioral health, and we look for different ways to um, you know, help those providers along. You know, sometimes there's just not that much funding. Like ONC, we're a small organization. We can work on the standards to help facilitate exchange, but we can't really incentivize beyond that. But I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, that's part of the difficulty when it comes to measurement to think, like, how do we even understand what's going on in that space? All of these surveys that we do are very costly endeavors, and that's just to understand the extent of the issue. So, you know, to solve the issue will take a lot more work. And I, you know, hopefully, you know, partnering with HLC that we can start to understand some of those um, other parts of the healthcare system that um, we need to help along. So, historically, I think. Um, in 2009, Meaningful Use won. There was a question about whether to include those constituencies or not. I was tangentially involved in it at the time, and I think the reasoning was, you know, trying to uh, automate and make electronic medical practices and health practices was going to be expensive, and therefore, here's the dollars that are available. And I think the calculus was, are those institutions prepared, even if they receive incentive dollars, to invest in the automation necessary to do the things that were encountered? You can debate whether that was a right decision or not. I don't know where I land on that particular issue, but I think that was part of it, is they were really left out. Then they were included in subsequent regulations in a mandate without uh, financial support. Well, that wasn't a very good idea. But it was because we were trying to sweep them along. And um, you know, we, we really did make some mistakes along the way, along with some good things. But that was one of the mistakes. I think if we went back and redid it, Meaningful Use should have included all of those. Meaningful Use 1, like let's go back to prehistoric age, should have included all of those institutions and provided them with financial support. We should have bit the bullet and understood that that was going to cause some struggles for some challenged parts of the healthcare delivery system, so we should have done that. And the second is that meaningful use should have been way less prescriptive and way more outcomes oriented. You know, the kind of we don't care how you do it as long as you get it done would have helped a lot and it would have made a big difference to institutions that are not well resourced. So I, I think we stubbed our toe badly then um, and it really, was, it really was a problem. So let's fix it now. Yeah. So, um, you know, a yeah, great question. Uh, as there are limited resources, you can't, you know, do this connectivity for long-term acute care, SNFs, et cetera. So our approach was uh, 
let's look at zip code level data in terms of where there is the biggest impact you could have you know, across the country and start investing in making the connectivity, you know, at least because uh, we do put a lot, because we do see direct impact and value and outcomes, um, you know, we have started, you know, again, uh, leveraging, you know, the public data sets, you know, these are the zip codes where we can have the biggest impact. You know, these are the zip codes where we see, you know, whether it's health equities or, you know, like, uh, or even, you know, where we have seen high, uh, like, uh, you know, impacts of readmissions cost and focusing on, you know, the whole transitions of care. Mm -hmm. And then we have seen good results, so we are, you know, like uh, uh, getting uh, more focused investments there, right? So that's the only way to do it. You can just try to do it across the country. It has to be targeted, focused, and outcome-driven, which would lead to more investments. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the one other thing I should add is um, at ONC, we have a federal health IT strategic plan that we bring in federal partners from across the government, and we have a federal health IT coordinating council. And we constantly look to ways to partner with some of the um, government agencies that you know regulate or have some equity in those types of um, providers to find ways to work together to leverage their um, grant funding, their programs to um, use standardized health IT um, to help them along. I would I would say two things, just a piece of one. Let these well-funded folks uh, do the experimentation, and you can pick up the uh, the 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 good stuff that that comes out of it to say, oh, like this is the this is the way to do it. I think that's that's one thing. Also, keep doing what you're doing. Like just keep asking the tough questions. There's a lot of media in the room. Like speak to us in the media and make sure that story doesn't get forgotten. So that way we can uh, be part of that. And and they do listen. I mean, you know, we play a role as as media in in our industry to just highlight some of these forgotten areas, these areas that maybe don't have as much spotlight. But now we've started to realize that, hey, we need to bring them along, too, because of all the medication issues. These people are ending back up in the ED, in the ED when we don't have medication reconciliation, a form of interoperability. So, um, yeah, we just need to find those, keep finding those champions, keep asking those tough questions. Well, and I think, Colin, you have 50 underscored. points for Colin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you've underscored that alignment of incentives. So you're beginning to see the investment that the government didn't make coming from the private sector, because it's going to be in their interest to get those better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned readmission, so obviously an interest mm -hmm. for hospitals to partner um, with these organizations as well. But yes, it was left out because of money, pure and simple. Yep. So I think we're going to end it there. Uh, and these folks are going to be available afterwards if you want to come up and ask them individual questions. Uh, but I want to just, on behalf of everyone here in the audience and everyone online, thank you to the panelists for sharing all your perspectives. <laughs> Now, of course, everyone's waiting, so who won? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I have to say Mary is the winner. <gasps> oh. You have the most so points. With, uh, by my calculation, uh, about 25 points, I think we're given to you. And the least technically knowledgeable. I like that. It, it's good, though. And so Mary, your prize is, um, so the bill for today can go to Mary. She's, she's won the bill for today. Thank you, but, Colin. No, thank you very much for thank being you. on the panel and, and being good, good sports about this. Great. All right. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Colin.